you need to. Perfect. Good afternoon um, and welcome to the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework Request for in Information Overview and q and I'm Rob Tennant, uh, Vice President for Federal Affairs. And you can probably hear my security expert in the background barking, um, probably a squirrel on the lawn. Uh, next slide, please. So what I wanted to do is uh, give you um, a little background on Weedy. And I think you'll find that uh, you know, without um, Weedy, we might not have the robust um, health information technology environment that we have today. Uh, if you can believe it, uh, Weedy was formed way back in 1991 by Dr. Lewis Su Sullivan, who was then a uh, secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and a practicing physician. Um, he actually called uh, in experts and leaders uh, in the healthcare field and said, there's got to be a way for us to do a better job at moving data. So he uh, charged them to find ways to standardize, to move uh, transactions from um, manual to electronic. And he also uh, talked about the need to protect data as it was moving electronically. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, two witty reports that were written in the early 90s were turned into legislative language that made its way into the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, the law that we know as HIPAA. And in fact, Weedy was named in HIPAA as an advisor uh, to the HHS secretary, and we've performed that role ever since. We, we've worked with all the administrations, uh, and we have a close relationship uh, with uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, the Office for Civil Rights, OCR, uh, and the Office of the National Coordinator uh, for Health IT, ONC. Uh, next slide, please. And the way that we work is very simple. We are f facilitators. We bring industry stakeholders together to identify challenges and opportunities and come up with solutions. And you can see here, we have more than uh, 350 member organizations. We have numerous work groups, including uh, the privacy and security work group. Um, we have, uh, of course, open pub, public forums like the one you're attending today. Uh, we track regulations. Um, we uh, testify before uh, advisory bodies and we issue comment letters. And, and finally, we often have special initiatives. So for example, we recently formed um, the uh, No Surprises Act task group to address some of the challenges associated with that uh, particular uh, legislation. And you can see here at the bottom, our members really represent every facet of the industry from, from practitioners to health plans to to vendors. We actually have CMS and ONC on our board of directors as well. Uh, next slide, please. And as I said, you know, our, our mission is very simple. We are a convener. We bring the various stakeholder groups together. And there aren't many forums where you can have a conversation um, like, like we have at Weedy, when you, you, you can hear every voice at the table. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in Weedy and learning more about us, to, uh, to go to weedy.org. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll go to the next slide. We'll talk about uh, today's agenda. Um, so I am pleased to have uh, Kevin Stein um, join us from NIST. Uh, he uh, may have some of his colleagues uh, staff in to, to assist him. Um, and that's going to uh, be an, an opportunity to hear directly um, about the RFI from Kevin. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A. So it'll be your chance to ask um, NIST some questions to find out about what, they're, uh, what, what work they're doing about the RFI and what they're lo looking for. Um, and then the last part I'll I'll invite the uh, co-chairs co of the Weedy Privacy and Security um, 
work group, uh, Marilyn Z Zegman, Luke, and Tina Grande, uh, to really lead a discussion of, about the types of um, comments that Weedy may want to make in response to this RFI. So we've got a, it'll be a busy hour and a half. It'll be an exciting one. Uh, and uh, if you go to the next slide, but I just wanted to remind you, this is, uh, again, a unique opportunity to interact with one of the leading experts in the nation. And you, you'll be able to do that by going into the chat and typing your questions or making comments. Uh, please know that we um, capture all of the comments. And so we're able to use those later. So if you have something that you'd like to interject, perhaps, into the conversation, perhaps asking if we could address this or that in our comment letter, please en enter it in the chat. Uh, and as we say here, slides and recording um, of this event will be emailed out to everybody um, after the event. And with that, um, it's my pleasure to uh, turn it over to Tina to introduce uh, Kevin and the team. Next slide, please. Great. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Excellent. Well, thank you, Rob, for a great introduction to Weedy. And I'm so pleased to be here with my co-chair, Marilyn Zygmunt Luke, and the rest of the Weedy membership here to hear from you, Kevin, um, about this really important RFI. Um, Kevin Stein is with us today. He's the Chief of Applied Cybersecurity, um, the Division of Cybersecurity at NIST. And uh, Kevin, just wanted to ask if you've got any of your colleagues with us today. Uh, I, I think I did see Adam Sedgwick uh, join in the list. So Adam, we kind of are the bookends in this list uh, on the Great. slide right now. Great, well, welcome Adam as well. And John and Sherilyn, if you're on, we are pleased to hear about this important um, RFI. I think, um, as everyone knows, uh, cybersecurity has been a hot topic for the last few years, and I think in the last couple of months, it's become even more um, discussed, and we are thankful for all the technical expertise that NIST has given over the years in the area of cybersecurity uh, for the healthcare industry. And um, I am going to pass the baton to Marilyn to also say hello to everyone and give a few opening comments and then we'll get started. Thank you. Tina, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I know that we've got a lot on the agenda and for those who have been working with the cybersecurity framework for the, through the years, you know that this has been a very foundational and important document it is referenced in a host of federal regulations, policy discussions, and has really been uh, a real good foundational document to reference in terms of cybersecurity. Before we get started, just a quick note about the privacy and security work group that Tina and I co-chair. It is a group for discussion and Weedy does plan on developing comments in response to the request for information. So for those of you who may be interested in joining our discussions about this or other privacy and security topics, please let us know. We would be happy to take any additional or new members uh, for that work group. So Tina, with that, let me turn it back to you or Kevin, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Kevin, you can kick it off. Thanks, Marilyn. Sure. So thanks, Tina and Marilyn and Rob. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, I mean, Weedy certainly has a special place in my heart. I joined uh, NIST almost 16 years ago. Uh, actually, prior to prior to working at NIST, uh, starting in NIST, I worked at the FDA for a few years. Uh, prior to that, some some industry time. Uh, but when I joined NIST from FDA, I I helped to establish our healthcare cybersecurity program at NIST. Uh, and one of my first interactions and quite honestly, my first uh, official travel at NIST was to attend a Weedy meeting that was being hosted in Orlando, uh, where we, we uh, you know, engaged with folks like uh, Sue Miller, for example, I think a, 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 maybe a former, maybe a current Weedy member, uh, you know, and a number of other folks uh, on security and privacy issues at the time. 
uh, and that certainly informed a lot of our kind of early healthcare focused, healthcare cybersecurity focused work at NIST. And, and it's been great to engage, uh, you know, periodically with Weedy over the last, you know, 15 years for sure. Uh, very excited to be able to, to talk with you all today and, and definitely appreciate all the, the support and input that you've provided over the years to us. Um, so I think most folks are probably familiar with NIST. Um, and, and before we even get into some of the main content, I mean, our, our plan is to keep our remarks brief and really make this as interactive as possible. So we're happy to take questions at any time, uh, questions or, or any type of kind of shaping input that you'd like to provide today or things you'd like us to consider as we embark on this, uh, this likely update to the cybersecurity framework. Um, I mean, I, I think just kind of broad brush from a, from a NIST cybersecurity perspective, our focus is very much on building trust. And that trust is not just in the technologies, you know, building trust in technologies that we all use and we're all dependent upon, both from our, in our professional lives or in our personal lives and in the services and, inter, uh, and organizations we interact with, um, but also from a process perspective. And I think that's something that's very kind of, it, it, there's some unique aspects of the way we engage in this with the broader community. And that's everything that we do is done in a very open and transparent and collaborative way. I think it's meetings like this one and RFIs, as much as they're not fun to respond to, and, I, and uh, we were remarking before the meeting started that there are a lot of RFIs right now. There are a lot of uh, cybersecurity and privacy focused policy initiatives uh, for sure coming out of the government, and there are certainly many in industry as well. So we are very thankful for your time today, but also your willingness to kind of take a look at our RFI and provide us some good uh, input to help shape some of the things that we'll we'll work on with respect to the framework. I think that open and transparent and collaborative approach really helps to build trust, not just in, in the process that we use, but also in, in, in the eventual outputs, the deliverables, the resources, whether they be the standards, the guides, the, the example implementations, that type of input and that open and collaborative approach really helps to not only build trust in those, but likely increases their use and adoption, which is ultimately what we wanna see. We want these things to be used so that they can then help organizations to make meaningful improvements to the way they manage cybersecurity and privacy and other types of risks uh, that their enterprises face on a daily basis. So I, most folks I, I'm sure are aware of the cybersecurity framework. It's been, about, it's been around uh, in existence for about eight years, uh, actually just a, a scooch over eight years. Uh, back in 2014, it was originally driven by an executive order in 2013 uh, and had a, a focus on critical infrastructure and helping critical, critical infrastructure owners and operators better understand, manage, and communicate cybersecurity risk. And we developed that through a, a year long kind of consultative process, if you will, a number of workshops, kind of roll up your sleeves opportunities, working side by side with industry and healthcare was very involved then. And we're, we're thrilled that you were then and, and certainly have been along this journey with us over the last eight years, eight plus years. Uh, and that resulted in kind of version 1.0 of the framework back in February of 2014. And since then, we've been thrilled with the uptake, not just domestically across the, the various critical infrastructure sectors, including healthcare, uh, but certainly well beyond critical infrastructure into really all sectors and segments of the economy. Uh, and, and even uh, more significant uptake, uh, both because of policy requirements, but also because of the value it provides, uptake of the CSF in, in government, not just federal, but even state and local as well. And I think earlier there were some remarks that you've even seen the framework kind of be referenced uh, in a number of different rules and regulations, again, not just at the federal, but I think even at the state and local levels as well, and increasingly internationally. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things that we've observed and helped to, to kind of you know, spur you know, interest and adoption and over the last several years is really the international uptake of the framework. And in fact, we have uh, most recently uh, released another uh, couple of translations of the framework. So now we're up to 10 foreign language translations of the framework. But even more so, we, we have been able to share international adaptations of the framework where the framework really serves as the basis for other nations or foreign industry uh, efforts to understand and manage risk. And that becomes the basis for their national cybersecurity strategies in some cases uh, by other nations. So we're thrilled to see that type of broad and global uptake. 
we last updated the framework in April of 2018. All the years blur together, but I think it was April 2018. And at that time, we made some pretty, uh, we, we made some enhancements to the framework based on feedback and lessons learned over the first you know, several years, first four years. And that included increased treatment of supply chain discussions and considerations in the framework. It included increased discussion around identity and access management, which is very much a fundamental capability for cybersecurity and privacy as well. And we also you know, increased just clarification around you know, things we've learned over the first four years to help provide greater clarification on how the framework can be used and opportunities there. So we're thrilled to have that update out there. Since 2018, certainly a lot has changed, continues to change. You know, the threat landscape continues to evolve very rapidly. The technology landscape does as well. The state of standards and guides, you know, rules, regulations, policies, we're all in a constant state of change. And certainly we want to make sure that the framework can continue to evolve in the right way and in a meaningful way to help organizations continue to see it and use it as a, the valuable resource that it is to help you better understand, manage, and communicate risk and really bring through that common language or taxonomy, bring greater alignment and harmonization across the, the diverse cybersecurity initiatives and activities that are happening both across the nation, around the world, you know, within our sectors, and even within our own individual organizations as well. So we figured now is a great time to launch a process to, to gain feedback to inform a likely future update of the cybersecurity framework. And we do that through the formal process of an RFI. And that RFI has three main components. If you, I think of them as three buckets that we're asking for feedback on. The first bucket is, is purely on, on the cybersecurity framework itself. So you know, we want to get feedback on use of the framework, uh, potential updates to the content in the framework. You know, what's working, what's not? You know, are there areas where it would make sense for us to increase our treatment of certain topics in the framework? Maybe back off on some other ones, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, but mainly just make sure that that get the feedback to ensure that the framework is responsive to the needs of organizations, of sectors, and really of the nation as well. So that's the first bucket. Second bucket is, is about the framework and other NIST cybersecurity resources in context. You know, I mentioned we last updated the framework in 2018, and since then we've issued other resources as well. I'd say, you know, one of the most visible resources, and I think many in the healthcare space were involved in its development, was our uh, kind of complementary privacy framework, which follows a very similar kind of structure and taxonomy, but in the context of, of privacy risk management. That's certainly a, a major development since the cybersecurity framework was last updated. So are there things that we can do to ensure greater alignment between the cybersecurity framework and the privacy framework as one example. There are other resources that we've had over the years and have continued to maintain such as our risk management framework, which uh, ha has a, a system and federal, federal organizational view of managing cybersecurity at the system and organization level. You know, how does the cybersecurity framework integrate and effectively, can it, can it effectively be used in tandem with that? Uh, you know, over the last year, we've been operating under an executive order from the president uh, which has had a very strong focus on supply chain risk management and specifically on the software supply chain, both from the perspective of software developers, but also from software acquirers, the organizations like you and me that are procuring software and having a better understanding of how to improve the security of those and really view the software supply chain and opportunities to improve the security of that. So how do we best align the cybersecurity framework infuse the right kind of logic at the appropriate level from these other resources uh, into the framework as well uh, in meaningful ways. So we'd love to have feedback there and how all these things can better be used kind of as different pieces that when put together uh, kind of form a more coherent you know, you know, picture of how you're managing risk across all these different disciplines. And the third area or third bucket that we're asking for feedback on is specifically in the area of uh, cybersecurity in supply chains. And I look at that in, in two different ways. One is how we're integrating supply chain in the cybersecurity framework. So how we do it today, based on what we've learned over the last several years as a community, are there uh, 
additional considerations we should try to fold into the cybersecurity framework to make sure that it continues to be relevant from a supply chain, cybersecurity supply chain risk management perspective. And the other thread is, you know, even beyond the cybersecurity framework, understanding, uh, having a better understanding of the challenges that organizations are facing with respect to managing cybersecurity and supply chains today. What are some of those gap areas? Because that having that understanding will help to inform steps that NIST can take. And there are certainly many agencies and many organizations that have responsibilities and interests in supply chain. <coughs> Excuse me. But understand that input will help to inform actions that NIST might take uh, to help produce resources that will provide value in helping organizations to manage cybersecurity in the supply chains, whether those are software supply chains like the executive order over the last year has talked about, focused on, or even other layers of technology, including hardware, information technology, operational technology, potentially medical devices, all those types of things that, that may be specific to the healthcare space as well. So those are the three large buckets uh, of, of feedback that we're, we're you know, in search of. Um, Certainly, uh, we'd entertain and appreciate any kind of feedback you have, not just in those three areas, but certainly you know, in, in other areas as well. Uh, the RFI has been out for, for several weeks now. It does close at the end of this month on April 25th. Uh, and, and I will make sure to uh, include kind of the basic logistics information uh, in the chat uh, uh, here shortly, but April 25th. So we, uh, we're certainly eager to get your feedback. Uh, and, and happy to start that through some uh, robust question and answer discussion right now. Uh, before we move into that, I uh, wanted to uh, maybe call on my, my uh, friend and colleague, Adam Sedgwick. Adam, do you have anything you want to add to amplify messages here? No, I, I think that was, uh, that was great and uh, look forward to a robust Q&A. Terrific, thanks. Great. Well, Kevin and Adam, thank you so much. Kevin, that was very informative. And Marilyn and I now would like to open up Q&A to our member organizations who are on uh, the meeting with us today. And if, if I can maybe take the liberty of um, asking the first question. Oh, and Rob, I just see there are a lot of questions. So maybe really, really quickly, I'll ask my question and and Marilyn, we can then turn to Rob, who has a whole list of them. Does that sound good? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Kevin, as, as you well know, most of the organizations who are participating in this meeting are, are HIPAA-covered entities or business associates, and they've had a long, long history of complying with the HIPAA security rule. And I'd love to know how you all at NIST um, look at the HIPAA rules, both for security and you reference the privacy frame, framework as well, um, and, and how you work in aligning um, the security framework um, and privacy frameworks with the HIPAA rules, and then how you think about it also for information that falls outside of HIPAA, which as you know, is just an ever-growing pool of what they call health information and quotations that don't fall into the HIPAA privacy and security rules. So I guess alignment with HIPAA and then how you think about information up outside of it. Yeah, great question. And had I actually been smart, I would have addressed that when I was in my opening remarks. Um, so, so again, it, the, the framework is, is kind of sector agnostic, uh, you know, when we issue it. So it's not specific to healthcare or any other sector, for example. Uh, but we, you know, many organizations and many sectors have tailored it or customized it to meet their specific needs and be responsive to those. And we certainly are very supportive of that and encourage that. And, and we've even supported and helped with some of those tailoring efforts uh, to make sure that it can be most relevant and, and use the language and be responsive to the needs of the sector. Um, shortly after, within a couple of years after we issued the version 1.0 of the framework, uh, the Office for Civil Rights and the Office of the National Coordinator uh, embarked on an effort and they worked with NIST on this to map the HIPAA security rule and the cybersecurity framework. And I think that that was uh, terrific uh, for a lot of reasons. One, having that mapping does give organizations that are kind of you know, HIPAA covered entities and business associates an understanding of how this new cybersecurity framework thing relates to you know, the requirements that they're already you know, beholden to from a, from a, a HIPAA you know, rule perspective. 
Um, but it also was a great and kind of authoritative statement from the, the from HHS, you know, specifically OCR and ONC, on how they view the relationship between these things, and that they can be used uh, in tandem to ultimately manage, you know, uh, you know, health information in a variety of different forms, uh, whether it's kind of you know covered under the the EPHI uh, moniker or not. Um, we are fortunately, we have a, a good longstanding and strong relationship with all the various parts of HHS and, and continuing with OCR uh, for sure. Um, one of our uh, resources that even predates the cybersecurity framework is a special publication that we issued in the past on uh, helping organizations better understand and implement the HIPAA security rule. Coming at it from this perspective, you know, what are the security capabilities that are discussed within the rule? Uh, and different considerations and approaches for implementing those. We have actually launched an update to that publication. And if you're wonky and, and tracked the NIST numbers, that's a special publication 800-66. It's been quite a while since we've updated that, but we have uh, initiated an update to that. And in fact, we should have a draft out for comment, uh, you know, more things for you to look at, a draft out for comment uh, in the not so distant future. That is something that we have socialized and are, are getting feedback early and often from OCR on. And I think that will, that through that publication, we will seek to, uh, you know, leverage as much of the cybersecurity framework as we can, uh, again, to help, you know, demonstrate how these tools can work together through the specific lens of the HIPAA security rule. Great, thanks. Marilyn, did you have anything before we turn to Rob? I know he's he's got we, we do have one question um, that came up in the chat, and then Kevin, I do have one question about the supply chain, but specifically in terms of ransomware, is the RFI specifically looking to address that? If not, do you want comments on that? What's your, what's your perspective? Sure. So yeah, we'd be happy to, to receive comments on the framework in context of ransomware. It's not specific to ransomware, uh, but we certainly welcome that feedback. We'll say one thing that we did issue recently was a customization or a tailoring. We call it a profile, a framework profile within the last uh, you know, month or so, specific to ransomware. So, uh, you know, using the cybersecurity framework as a tool to help manage risk of ransomware. Uh, I will put a link in the uh, in the chat here momentarily. But that was a, in many ways, it was a great opportunity for us to view and use the framework looking at it through the lens of a very specific threat. So looking at it through the lens of ransomware and what are some of the strategies and tools and capabilities that organizations should consider when you uh, look to identify, protect, detect, respond and recover from ransomware issues. Um, so we think that's a great opportunity. We'd welcome feedback on that as well. And I'll, I'll put a link in the, uh, the chat here momentarily. And Kevin, could you also speak to the issue of supply chain? Because I think depending upon where you're sitting in terms of your own organization and the weedy participation, that means different things to different people. So in terms of uh, supply chain, if you're a hospital, may, may mean medical devices and drugs and saline and supplies. Whereas if you're a health plan, the supply chain may include your vendors, cyber efforts, um, cybersecurity vendors. So what, what is your thinking in terms of the supply chain as it applies to the cybersecurity framework so that we can help develop some comments that would help you about that? Yeah, it, certainly supply chain is a very loaded term and it, and it can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. Uh, so I, we are not necessarily looking at supply chain from the perspective of, you know, your, your uh, ability to to get you know new medical devices or or insulin or whatever the case may be, our focus is very much on the cybersecurity aspects of supply chain, and how organizations can both kind of gain visibility into their supply chains from a cybersecurity perspective, and also be in a better position to understand and manage the risks, uh, you know, both to and from those supply chains. Uh, that you have from a cybersecurity perspective. So certainly any feedback that you have on the cybersecurity dimensions of supply chain uh, would be very, very welcome. We do have a body of, uh, again, so we, we've been working in the supply chain space for uh, cybersecurity supply chain space for, for quite a while as well, and do have a body of uh, resources. Um, I'd be happy to 
to share some of those direct links uh, as well. But we want feedback to ensure one, that the framework continues to be responsive to the supply chain needs of organizations, cybersecurity supply chains more specifically. Uh, and if there are other resources even outside the framework that would be valuable to have to help address some of the specific challenges that, are that organizations are facing, we'd love to have feedback on that as well. Well, that's great, thank you. Rob, I know you've got a series of questions. Let me turn to you and see if you wanna kick off a few more. Sure, and um, let me uh, start um, first with a question uh, from Janice. Uh, she asks about the cybersecurity uh, and infrastructure um, uh, security agencies, CISA, um, because uh, Kevin, as you alluded to, there's a lot of um, interest in cybersecurity. There is an enormous uh, number of agencies with fingerprints all over this issue. Um, how does NIST interact specifically with CISA, but also um, the concern always with government is uh, that agencies are working in, in silos. And uh, is there any kind of coordination, for example, between um, NIST and OCR and, and NIST and CMS that, that all sort of um, have an <clears throat> involvement in this area? So you're absolutely right, and we and just being part of the government, we certainly know that that you know that at times there are silos, and certainly our intention is to not duplicate efforts, uh, but but focus on areas where maybe NIST has a unique ability to provide value, uh, and we try to be very open about that, including with our interagency partners as well. Um, we do work very closely with CISA in a number of different capacities. They certainly have a much more operationally focused mission. Uh, ours is very much on the, the standards and guidelines uh, to inform both operations, but also to inform good cyber policy. Uh, so we, we believe strongly that kind of the, having a solid foundation of you know, uh, well-formulated and meaningful standards and guidelines can provide a solid foundation for good cyber policy as well as good operational activities. So we do engage very frequently with CISA uh, you know, in areas like supply chain, um, there are, there's a lot of interest across a lot of different agencies. Uh, our, our hope through this RFI and certainly other, other forums, including this discussion today, is to get feedback that can help us formulate an, an approach and the right set of resources that would be most appropriate for NIST to produce so that we're not duplicating, but rather complementing or adding value to things that other agencies or even that industry is doing as well. Adam, do you want to chime in on that at all? Any additional thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the engagement is both um, formal and informal. I mean, I think on a on a daily basis, we're having informal discussions with them, and then um, we actually have our own um, MOU with CISA that talks about how we can work together. Um, I think particularly for this RFI and the CSF process, um, that they're going to be very involved and very engaged. Um, I think you'll see them at our workshops and we'll certainly um, consult with them um, when the responses come in to make sure that their expertise is reflected. That's great. Um, and I'm going to uh, follow up on, on some of the qu questions uh, that, um, that were asked in the chat, but also uh, from Tina and Marilyn. And, um, I'll start, I guess, um, with a high level question. And that is, um, you know, I, as you mentioned, um, uh, the framework uh, was last modified in, in 2018. Um, a lot has happened, uh, even though it's not that, that long ago, but um, the environment is, ch is changing. And it, uh, it, from your perspective, both Kevin and Adam, what's been the biggest change? Um, in the environment. Uh, obviously, ransomware is, is part of it, but there seems to be a hyper focus on cyber security, um, as Tina said. Uh, what's been the biggest changes in the environment um, in the years since the uh, framework was modified? Yeah, I, I, I think there, there have probably been a lot. Um, it's certainly been a lot of changes. I, I think certainly ransomware and other very highly visible, uh, you know, threats that actually have very visible impacts that 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 we as you know average everyday 
you know, citizens and, and, and folks see. I mean, I, I think there have been a lot of uh, kind of eye-opening moments where it's become more real to a lot of people. I think Colonial Pipeline and some of the more visible and high-impact ransomware attacks have been, you know, kind of above-the-fold stories for sure uh, that, that have drawn the attention of, of a, a much greater audience than maybe would have attracted in the past. So I think that's certainly, the visibility is there. Uh, not necessarily a good thing, but but it is there. I think the other thing from from a, from a broader perspective is because of that increased visibility, cybersecurity, and it's been it's been kind of a a, a trend that we've been seeing you know, over the last you know decade or so, and I think it, it's it's been even more rapid over the last you know couple of years and even several months, is that cybersecurity is increasingly you know, kind of an enterprise issue. It's not just the thing that the CIO or the IT folks do or the operational technology folks do, but it really is an enterprise risk to be managed at the enterprise level. So, so I, I think one of the areas that we, we've received feedback on over the last couple of years, you know, on the framework, and we've seen great progress from, from some sectors and some organizations is how do we bring the cybersecurity discussion cybersecurity risk management discussion even more uh, completely into the broader enterprise risk management discussion of the organization. So that cybersecurity is being managed alongside financial and reputational and safety and compliance and all the other dimensions of risk that organizations are managing today. Uh, this has been an area of increasing interest and, and effort on our part, uh, certainly in industry as well. And I, I think, as I think about updates to the cybersecurity framework, Having more hooks or, or more content to help bridge that communications divide, if you will, between cybersecurity risk management and broader enterprise risk is a tremendous opportunity that we have. So I, I would just add to that a little bit. I mean, one of the things that's true across NIST, and if, uh, if a way oversimplified way to describe what NIST do is, is generating reference material is that when we generate this reference material, we're often um, completely surprised in how it's being used. Um, and sometimes we have a pretty good plan to say, oh, this is great, we'll put this in the reference material, this is what the stakeholders said, and they'll be used in this way. And sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's used in different ways. And I think the cybersecurity framework overall is a really good example of that, right? It was really um, focused in on critical infrastructure, um, and a lot of the conversations were around those sort of more limited use cases, um, but almost immediately it had this much broader uptake and um, organizations uh, in sectors or that you wouldn't normally qualify, consider critical infrastructure, were using it really robustly. Um, and we've developed some really interesting partnerships and we've learned a lot from the, those types of organizations that, that are using them. Um, so that's one big change. And I think it also goes with this trend of, you know, initially cybersecurity was more in the realm of people working for government and then critical infrastructure. And now it has this really, every organization considers it and is a much uh, broader application. So, that, so that's something that I think we think a lot about going into this and how do we make our resources um, more consumable as a result, given that it has a much broader application. And then, you know, as Kevin mentioned, I think the threat space has obviously evolved and also the infrastructure has evolved. And in some cases, the threat space evolved with the infrastructure evolving. And that gives us some, some, a good ability to sort of think about how do we make these enterprise guides more meaningful given that um, the way that uh, the devices are looking differently and the workforce is looking really differently. Um, so the pandemic is a great example of that, obviously. I'll just, I'll just put it out there because I'm sure that's what people thought I was talking about. Um, but even the, uh, some of the capabilities that has been a real focus within the US government like zero trust, right? There's a threat component of that. One of the reasons why people are really excited about zero trust is because it'll limit ransomware, right? It won't, ransomware has this way to propagate kind of across an organization. Good zero, zero trust implementation, that's a lot less likely. Uh, but it also makes more sense in this environment where um, more people will be working remotely. Um, so those are all going to be really interesting things for us to look at. And one of the things I think people aren't really aware of is while we have these, um, a lot of these resources that are really tailored to the cybersecurity framework, that's like the ransomware profile and the other use cases for particular sectors, 
Um, the team at NIST has also really looked at the publications on a variety of topics to show organizations how it can map back to the cybersecurity framework. So once you have that foundation and you have a plan and you're using uh, the language of the framework or similar language that's rooted in standards, when there's a particular use case or particular um, interest of yours, you can look at that guidance and then understand um, how you can really adapt it because you have that strong foundation. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the RFI is structured in that way, um, because we want to think holistically and not just about the framework itself. Excellent. Um, and first of all, uh, Kevin, thank you for putting those links in the chat. Uh, you know, folks will find those extremely helpful. So I've got a, a question about ransomware, then I got one on the supply chain. Um, ransomware obviously has gotten the attention of Congress. Um, and there was recently passed uh, legislation requiring um, entities um, in these, these critical infrastructure areas to report a ransomware attack within, I believe, 72 hours. Um, is, can you uh, comment on if you are looking to update the framework in light of this new requirement on the reporting side, because 72 hours uh, is not a long time. And so I think one of the things that entities are concerned about is the workflow. How would we go about understanding if uh, and, and when the ransomware uh, attack occurred? How can we get in place a mechanism to be able to report that to meet the requirements of the law. I, I'm just, you know, from my perspective, I think that would be a very helpful addition to the framework, but I, I'll, I'll turn it to you then. Yeah, I, I don't see the framework being that specific to talk about, uh, you know, in, in the context of, uh, you know, 72 hour reporting, for example, but I, I think the framework, and, and this is very helpful feedback, uh, I, I think that we can amplify or increase the discussion of the, in the framework around the types of capabilities or processes that would be good for organizations to have in place to enable you to both detect a, an issue, respond to that, and quite honestly report that um, in, in whatever you know requirement or regulatory regime that may be driving a specific time window. But I don't think because the framework is, is both technology, but also I would say you know law agnostic, if you will, I don't think we will get that specific. Um, certainly if a sector or organization chooses to kind of have a, a to create a framework profile or something that is customized to a specific sector or need, um, I mean, certainly those, those types of requ specific requirements could be reflected in that. And Adam, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, th th I think what I would add is, um... I think some of the foundations in the CSF were, were to address some of those challenges with reporting, right? So if you look at the CSF, one of the things we always point to in um, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. For a long time, all of our policies and even the standards and guidelines and best practices were really stuck in the first three. So, which really reflects a mindset of, oh, I can detect it and stop it from occurring instead of, hey, let's think about this in terms of the incidents are gonna happen, how you're gonna respond and recover. And I think with one of the unique things about ransomware is, and I think the term our colleague uses is data pressure, that the, the need to respond quickly is uh, much more acute and much more, um, the, the pressure ratchets it up than, than maybe other types of cybersecurity interests. Uh, cybersecurity instance where you might have a little bit more luxury to uh, investigate and understand what they took, why they took it, and what they might do with it. You're sort of at this risk of your company can't operate and it's spreading. So some of the stuff that we talk about in the ransomware profile that, that again, is connected to the CSF is building out those playbooks and uh, practicing them. So it's second nature when an incident does occur, you know exactly what to do, who to call and how your organization can respond. Um, but you know, one of the things that um, Kevin mentioned and, and why we don't often go to that level of specificity um, is because we want this to be something that can be used internationally. 
um, and in different um, types of organizations. And we also realize that laws and policies are going to evolve. So the, the, the way that we address those types of things in the, in the CSF is thinking about it and identify and having that be part of it, right? But your organization, you have to comply. You have to think about your, um, your obligations to regulators, to the government you're operating in and your customers and your employees. So that, that is sort of, we sort of build that in by making that part of the process, but then we can develop additional resources to say, okay, um, this group of companies is gonna have to comply with this law. Um, here's a profile that might help you do it. Or here's a crosswalk, which is something we're doing a lot in the privacy space, uh, just to make it easier for organizations, but still allow us to have something that can be uh, broadly applicable for the widest range of organizations. Rob, Adam made me think of something. If it's okay, I'd like to jump in with an additional question. Oh, of course. It, we have been working in terms of healthcare on interoperable records. And so the th thinking is that at some point there will be a lot more data exchanged. It will be available at the point of care. It will be available to the consumer. There is going to be a host of applications or apps as we call them that are going to be now interfacing with different kinds of entities that are covered by HIPAA. Some of these apps are not covered by HIPAA. And when we were thinking about the framework, as we work on things like the API interfaces or some of these more technical components, should we offer those types of scenarios or because the framework is intended to be more uh, agnostic to specific, I don't wanna say use cases, but specific regulations, would that be something that perhaps we should, we should think differently about? I, mean, I I think those use cases are extremely helpful. Um, so you know, the, especially with the way we structured the the RFI, where it, it is it is sort of a lot of this is an awareness thing for us as well, right? We only know we ha we have a good set of use cases, often things that are divided that are developed by industry that then we can share back. But then there's a lot we don't know about particular use cases of the CSF. So this RFI is meant to help us understand where is the CSF being used today. Um, but also where is it going to be used in the future? And then I think in that you know, second category of questions we have, what are the other things that we should be thinking about? Um, and maybe it's not something that we end up doing that's part of the CSF, but maybe it's a project we take to the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence that's very specific to a particular sector. So I think those sorts of use cases would, would, would be extremely helpful to, to highlight in the RFI. And then particularly if there are places where it sort of breaks the model of the CSF, we, we certainly need to know that as well. Thank you. And if I can't, um, let, let me just sort of build on, on Mar Marilyn's question because that's, it, it strikes me as a potential uh, completely new use case uh, for the framework. And that is more a uh, consumer centric. So you've got, you know, you've got your five um, functions, the ID, prevent, detect, uh, respond, and recover. That might also apply to a consumer who has gone through, as Marilyn said, has perhaps had an, uh, downloaded their PHI to an app and experienced um, you know, a disclosure or breach. Um, I wonder if there's, if there's an interest in creating almost a subset of the framework that would be aimed specifically at uh, consumers, um, and that could apply internationally as well. There, it, you know, um, you know, having your information breached from an app is certainly not um, just where 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 in the United States. I don't know if that has uh, been a topic of conversation and all that NIST. It, it, it certainly has, and I think, well, the, the framework is very much kind of organizationally focused or sector focused, even nation. I think it, it does provide value, and I think we've seen some organizations try to use this as a tool to help express kind of requirements or expectations or even capabilities that they're providing to their consumers. Now, whether those are individuals, 
in, in your context, potentially patients or small, small businesses, small provider practices, whatever the case may be, as a way to kind of express those security, both requirements, but also expectations. So um, with your partners and suppliers, for example. So I think there's certainly value there. I, I will say, you know, also under, under the most recent executive order, again, the focus has been pretty much, very much on software supply chain security. Um, but there were some consumer focused uh, efforts that we were directed to lead around, uh, you know, understanding how, how one could establish a cybersecurity labeling program for consumer IoT devices, as well as consumer software. You know, we certainly took the approach at NIST of understanding what are the technical criteria that could be used to support a label for those types of consumer technologies, both again, IoT, as well as consumer software uh, and understand how, how a producer of those technologies could demonstrate conformance to those requirements to support a potential label. Um, but again, with that focus on the consumer, a lot of it does come down to uh, you know, clarity of message, clarity of purpose, and being able to share you know, what cybersecurity capabilities in this context an IoT device or a piece of software has, and I'd say just as importantly, what it doesn't have so that the consumer is making a more informed decision. That, yeah, that, that's very helpful feedback, Rob. Can I hop in here, Rob, and piggyback on what, what you asked? Because Kevin, your response um, made me also think about the world of privacy. And in that um, space where there are no regulations, um, I know we do have the FTC, but certainly there's no HIPAA framework for a lot of um, health information that's being exchanged. Would you ever consider something like a label or some kind of a oh, you know how they use the term good housekeeping seal of approval or something along the lines as it relates to privacy. You know, I, I will be honest with you, um, you know, folks in the healthcare industry who, who fall within the HIPAA framework are, are fairly frustrated with Congress for not bringing every, everyone into the fold of some sort of a harmonized privacy regime so that trust doesn't erode you know, on the side where we already have a good regulation um, overseeing information exchange. And so we're always looking for some sort of a, a, a band-aid until Congress passes a, a national privacy law to better protect information or at least make consumers more aware of where there is no sufficient um, law to protect their information so that they can make an educated decision because certainly those privacy notices you know that come up on websites are very difficult to read and oftentimes if you want to opt out of something then you don't have access to the website so it doesn't feel like you're really exercising your right to privacy because you have to give up something in order to keep that uh, privacy situation so would love your thoughts on that and and your labeling discussion is what brought that up for me yeah certainly a adam might have some additional thoughts on this i think maybe to, to take an easy part of that question because it's there's a lot packed into that question I, I think one part nist does not have any plans to establish our own labeling programs either for cybersecurity or or for privacy in this context um we, we are we are great at kind of helping to uh, work with the community to develop technical criteria that can be used to support labels if an organization whether it's a government agency or an aspiring organization in industry like uh, you know a, an underwriters lab or a consumer reports or or a sector specific effort um, could certainly leverage our work and and, and support that but we, we don't have any plans to develop labels i i think Broadly speaking, I mean privacy is on a journey as well, and it's in a very different place than cybersecurity. Where, and we learned this very clearly in, when we developed the privacy framework, that cybersecurity had the benefit of having you know four decades worth of standards and practices and community understanding. So we started off in a very different place. Privacy, privacy in general does not. We, we've had fair information practice principles for for many decades. But there's been this gap between principles and practice that that really haven't been filled, you know, through standards and guides and other other things like that that really make it a little bit more practical to implement. So that divide really results in privacy being in a very different place. So you, 
it's probably premature to even think about a privacy label uh, in that context. Um, but but certainly our role at NIST wouldn't be on a label, but more so understanding how to and trying to produce resources that will help to bridge that gap between the principle and the practice through the standards and the guidelines, both things we develop as well as contributions we can make in international standards bodies, uh, which would then inform, you know, laws and rules and regulations that are, you know, not only in the U.S., but certainly around the world. And Adam, you want to add anything to that? You're, you're, you're running in this space a lot more than I am. <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think that's right. I mean, um, I think we feel your pain on privacy, and I think hardly a day goes by where I um, look at a document and someone is trying to talk about privacy considerations and they say, um, securing PII. And thanks to the privacy team, I know now to say, well, that's just part of it, right? <laughs> like, you can protect my data and still do things with it that cause privacy violations. Um, but that universe of how to help engineers think about privacy in the same way that lawyers have been is really a focus area of, of ours um, because you know, we're gonna have a very data centric world and um, reading notices is not gonna solve any problems if the data that's being collected is uh, you know, my car going down the highway and the EMT is here and they wanna check the data on my pacemaker, right? I mean. You can't click anything on that and you're still going to want people to have access for that data. So we really have to think about how do we better set expectations and help communities think about privacy in different ways. And I think the privacy framework does a really effective lens on that. It sort of says, you know, here's how protecting privacy, which is really focused on an individual has an impact on organizations. And I think it tells a really good story about how organizations should think about something that, that is in its very definition, very personal. You, know, you, you made me think about another framework and Kevin and Adam, if this is getting too far out, you know, feel free to tell me that. But your colleagues at NIST are also working on artificial intelligence and a framework and that one's focused more on bias. As the world, Adam, as you said, is gonna become more data-driven and data-oriented, a lot of the processes are going to become automated and they're going to use things like machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. Do you see the work that's going on with artificial intelligence intersecting here? If not, should we potentially add comments about that? What, what's your thinking there? So I would certainly encourage you to add comments on that. Uh, we are very aware of that and we do work very closely with our, our uh, colleagues on, on the AI side. In fact, there's a good bit of kind of sharing between the two in terms of the people that work on it at NIST. Um, and, and certainly that there is a relationship between the two while they have kind of slightly different focus areas. There are certainly cybersecurity dimensions to, uh, to managing risk in the context of AI. So we think both the cybersecurity framework as well as the privacy framework and other resources are certainly going to have the right hooks and touch points to, to inform AI, and I think vice versa. Um, again, we're, we're in different places of development and evolution, so I think as we learn information through this RFI, cybersecurity-focused RFI, that, can, that will definitely kind of behind the scenes be used to inform some of the AI discussions. So your, your feedback on that in particular would be very helpful. Yeah, and it gets at one of the other kind of bigger picture questions that we're trying to figure out at NIST and we really welcome people's help on, which is um, we have, we've started an acronym at NIST, YAF, which stands for yet another framework. So um, we're very mindful of how do we continue to provide resources that are tailored to particular areas of interest, but how do we do that in such a way that these frameworks are still interoperable and can work together, right? You're, um, you're concerned about your, the cybersecurity and privacy um, posed by the workforce that's implementing an IoT device that will be using that data for uh, an AI service. I think I just listed like 12 NIST frameworks. So um, how do we make sure, and, and, and actually they're, they're, they're pretty good, they're pretty consistent. But um, how do we both provide the resources for someone who says, no, I just want to know about AI, 
um, but but not break what's working with with these with with the variety of frameworks that we have. Appreciate that. So um, yeah, we've talked about pri privacy, and and the last thing we want is another RFI. But um, obviously, OCR put out uh, a proposed rule seeking to modify the privacy rule. Um, do you anticipate once that final rule comes out, circling back on the privacy framework? Uh, I, I, I'm not too familiar with that RFI, but I'll certainly check in with our privacy colleagues, see how much they're tracking it. I, I think uh, I wouldn't commit to, to revising the privacy framework, but I think we would want to see how the the, the uh, proposed revisions uh, kind of come together, what that might look like in the end, and if there are things that we can do to either help uh, you know, kind of strengthen the privacy framework that it, so that it can be even more valuable in the context of the new rule, uh, that would be fine. Definitely be up for that. Um, Tina met, mentioned sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval. Um, I, I wanna ex explore that a little bit. Um, the timing is good because just, um, uh, yesterday, um, again, OCR, the, the Office for Civil Rights, um, put out an, an RFI. Uh, and one of the questions uh, they have is around this concept that was included uh, in statute that HHS is required to um, take into account what they call recognized security practices. Uh, as they determine if there's any uh, enforcement action. Um, and to me, that um, is a huge opportunity for the industry. And I'll, I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Um, there's, there's two ways to look at cyber security. You can look at it as a mandate uh, and a compliance issue, or you, you can look at it as a business imperative that um, for example, healthcare entities um, must uh, adhere to certain standards, not just to pre pre prevent an enforcement action, that's probably the least of their worries, but more importantly, to protect their business, to protect their patients. And um, if you uh, subscribe like I do to, to the latter approach, um, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for NIST um, to create not so much a seal, but the uh, even a more um, specific, I would say checklist, but getting into the world of saying, uh, here, here's more than just the theory. Here's the practical application, especially uh, perhaps by entity size, because a large en entity, a large health plan, a, a, a large health se se uh, system, is vastly different than a, a, a small lab or, a, or a, a small regional hospital. So a long wind, a winded way of saying, is there an opportunity here to um, create an infrastructure to support what, um, what OCR is de de discussing in terms of this recognized security practice? So, I'm thinking out loud here because I'm not that we're not familiar with the rule, but I, I will say, you know, so um, we do have similar approach in some of the work that we do, but you know, um, everything we do is is risk based, right? So we can provide very specific recommendations, um, but ultimately, ultimately at the end of the day, there's a point in with in which organizations have to make those decisions themselves. Um, and that sort of handoff is a very tricky one. And often it makes organizations pretty frustrated because they come to us asking for very specific advice that we just can't give because we're not Deloitte, we're not KPMG, we can't spend three months with them understanding their business processes, how they brief their board and how they make decisions as an organization. Um, but with the model under FISMA, I mean, what we have done is recommendations for how organizations evaluate systems. Are they low, medium, or high risk? And once they make those decisions, recommended controls come in 
And everyone knows what these controls are. Everyone knows our process for updating them and people weigh in and say, that that control is not right. You should think of a different one. Um, but ultimately that's just a guide. And then the organization has to take it. And this is the process laid out in FISMA and sign an authority to operate and maybe make compensating controls. And that allows us to have very detailed recommendations that are applicable to the, you know, pick your small agency. My favorite is the Morris K. Udall Scholarship Fund, all the way up to the Department of Treasury or the Department of Commerce, um, because you sort of make those, those uh, changes based on your business environment, right? So the example we always use is you might have a screen uh, lock as a recommended practice and that I think we do have controls that say that's in the baselines. But if you're in a, if you're an air traffic controller, um, maybe that screen lock isn't such a great control. Um, and maybe you have compensating controls because you have gates, guards, and guns making sure that people aren't going to get onto your um, computer and you won't have that risk of turning around to get a cup of coffee and having your screen uh, totally blacked out. And there's, there's probably better examples that I should be giving within the healthcare sector. Um, so, you know, that's something that we could consider. Um, but, you know, we, we do have sort of processes to allow that. It's just that that kind of handoff is where it gets really tricky. And where do regulators and the organizations themselves step in and say, I see your recommendation. I've made my own risk management determinations. And this is how I'm going to move forward and implement my security program as a result. Rob, if I could just jump in, it made me think about one of the great benefits of the framework is that it is scalable based on the business's operating environment. It is not a mandate to do specific things. There's no specific technology that's rec recommended. And as we get into the regulatory context, oftentimes we have comments about the costs and the benefits of implementing a variety of security practices based on an organization's size and resources. And so one of the things that we've always felt was a real benefit to the framework was that it was scalable. It was having the ability to be flexible and to grow based on the operating environment. And I, I guess it's more of a comment than a question, you know, to the extent that we get into some of these other regulatory constructs where an agency may feel something is a great thing to implement, we always have to reinforce the fact that there is a cost benefit analysis that has to take place. And it's not rational to implement something that's gonna cost millions of dollars if 0.001% of the population is going to have some benefit from it. So that's just my comment there and, and appreciate you take, let me take the time. No, it's a, it's a great comment. And certainly, you know, we, we have lessons learned from that in the federal environment, right? There's a lot of things that people would love to implement but you're dealing with this legacy infrastructure and the process to get the investments to improve those things take years. Um, if, if you get them at all. So definitely um, have probably been making similar points as you have been um, to a different audience. Yeah, and just to build on that, Marilyn, um, you know, you think about the HIPAA security rule, which came out, I think the final rule was what, 2003. And it was touted back then as being exactly that scalable and, fle and flexible. So, you know, with it fit for a small practice or a large health plan. Um, and that's, that, that's the positive side of it. The negative side is it didn't give much direction. And I think um, that's the challenge. It's, it's that fine line between being prescriptive um, and, and recognizing that every entity is different and requires perhaps a slightly different approach. But um, what I've heard uh, and, and, you know, in my years working with physician practices is because they don't have the technical knowledge, um, they don't know what to do. And so there's uh, a need for, I don't want to say a cookbook of here's, here's what you need to do and how to do it. But frankly, that's exactly what they need. And, and I understand that NIST probably can't create that. Um, but I'm thinking that as we, um, get uh, uh, more sophisticated, especially when we have these accreditation and certification uh, entities in place like ENAC and HITRUST and others. I wonder if there could be 
uh, greater synergy between NIST and these um, good, good housekeeping seal of approval um, entities to make sure that we're able to create an environment that the smallest entity could take could take advantage of because it's you know the framework is 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 wonderful but if it's not read if it's not leveraged then we're not taking full advantage of it yeah i mean i i i'd agree i mean i think it's a real challenge and we certainly um uh, we certainly have resources and something we continue to think about. And I think, I hope we get a lot of information during the RFI process on how to address that challenge. Um, because, you know, you, you sort of see it, you see it both ways when you're, when you're meeting with small businesses. You want it high level, not overly complex, something they can read and speaks to their language. But is that something that's really implementable then? Probably not. So then you go in the other direction and you can be very specific. And some of our, um, particularly at the Center of Excellence, has very specific resources that's, you know, literally, you know, go to Microsoft, type this into this box. But then you're left with a document that might be 300, 400 pages. And of course, a smaller medium enterprise is going to look at that and say, I can't do anything with that. That's far too technical. So um, Getting it right and helping organizations understanding that there's different types of resources um, and, and maybe helping them get over the hump and not feel overwhelmed. And I'd really love to stop a lot of the hand wringing and help these smaller organizations understand that they might not have the resources as a larger organization, um, but they might have more flexibility and they might be able to do things that are differently and unique to them. And the result of them doing it is that they can do business a lot better because they have more comfort in the security protections that they're providing to their employees and their customers. And so thinking about that and how do we sort of say, well, here's something that you guys can't do that these bigger guys just wish they could, they could do, but they can't do it because they have this aging infrastructure or they have this many customers or they have to do business in 300 countries and you're doing business in one county. Um, I mean, those are things we'd all love to take on with the RFI update and moving forward. Oh, very good. And Can I follow up with a, oh, a, a sure, still sure. a healthcare topic, but it's a little bit um, different. Uh, and I know we've been talking about the risk-based approach to security. And I just wanted to ask you about it, what I think is perceived as a very high risk healthcare um, lane which is implantable medical devices and was wondering if you all how do you think about that i know the fda does do cybersecurity work itself to i think advise the medical device industry but you know i think the fear that runs through lots of people's minds is oh a pacemaker someone hacks in and you know you have a heart attack and you're dead on the ground i, I mean it's probably highly unlikely but at the same time they do seem incredibly um you know sensitive uh, to you know life itself for the individual with an implantable medical device. Um, do those hold any kind of a special category for you when you think about the framework or do they just fall sort of into that high risk category or how do you think about that issue? Yeah, I, I, I think the framework does and possibly not just the cybersecurity framework, but even some of our other resources around secure software development, for example. When you, when you think of an implantable medical device or even you know an infusion pump or some other type of medical technology, I mean, it, ultimately the, those are made of software as well. So how do we improve the quality and security of the software that's being used in those environments, whether in, in a care setting or, or inside the patient? Um, and, and I think some of this, it, it, it also comes down to, you know, at, really the, the development cycles for these technologies and development capabilities. How do we find that appropriate level of security given the fact that you know, the, the, the purpose of the device is to save lives or keep someone alive? You, know, you have to have the appropriate amount of security so that you won't have an adverse effect on the performance of that, of that technology. I, I think the, the framework, while it's not gonna get specific to that you know, itself, um, certainly some customizations or tailoring of the framework in that specific context is certainly possible. We've seen that in other areas like, uh, you know, advanced manufacturing, for example, where you think of conveyor belts, 
that are moving you know, goods and you have robotic arms picking things up and putting them in boxes. Very different from you know, a, a health and, and life safety perspective, something implanted in me. But the process from the framework perspective can very much be the same. Let's look at it, look at it in the context of this specific use case, this specific requirement, and understand what are the security capabilities or outcomes that are critically important in that context, and then plan to for different ways to implement those in a way that would allow the performance to be kind of top of mind. So, uh, the issue of um, implantable devices and security. I remember when it it reared its head years ago uh, when a sitting vice president, Dick Cheney, had uh, a pacemaker installed and there was all kinds of worry that uh, one of uh, our enemies was going to hack into it. But uh, yeah, but a, a, a huge issue. Um, it may be a question um, back to uh, uh, the supply chain issue. Um, and you know, we talked about how um, a health plan supply chain is, is different. You know, Marilyn, you, you, you mentioned health plan versus hospital. Um, one of the things that, that strike me, and I know you can't be prescriptive because everything um, it, uh, is different by entity, but I wonder if, if it would be helpful for NIST to craft perhaps a series of questions to ask. So for example, especially in a smaller setting, um, you, know, you don't know much about your, down, your downstream uh, supply chain, but if you are armed with a series of questions, you know, how do you handle this? Or um, if there is um, a breakage in the supply chain due to a ransomware attack, um, what is your contingency plan to make sure I get what I need? You know, a series of questions, not overly technical perhaps, but to prod um, folks to make sure they're asking those questions because that's a big part of what we're trying to do here is to raise the awareness level of what these uh, ent entities can do. I, I think that's a, a, an excellent point, Rob, and, and definitely one that, that we, we, we've thought about uh, as well. Um, and, and certainly may, many organizations that, that may be the way they use the framework is to you know, use it to ask questions of their partners and suppliers to understand what their sec security capabilities are but also use it as a way to express their security requirements and expectations of the organizations that they're working with. Yeah. Um, that could certainly be the same on, on the consumer side, you know, you know, understanding you know, how you're protecting my data as a patient, uh, you know, for example. So I, I think that certainly goes both ways, but I, I like the approach of, you know, here are the five or 10 questions that you need to consider and consider asking of those organizations that you're working with, you know, both from a supply chain and even a broader cybersecurity perspective. And um, just along those lines, um, Weedy is working uh, with Chime currently on developing a set of questions uh, for consumers uh, to ask themselves before they download their information uh, to an app. So I think, you know, arming uh, folks. Um, with this type of information, I think is going to make uh, life a lot, a lot better. And I really like your idea about the vendor taking those and being proactive and then going to a health plan or provider and saying, you know, I'm going to preempt you from asking the questions and here's how we address the following issues. I think that makes a lot of sense. Agreed. And we, we'd love to see the, the output from your collaboration with Chime uh, whenever that's ready. It'd be, it'd be very informative for us. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Good. You know, and um, I know you guys have recently created this National I Institute for Improving Sci Cybersecurity uh, in, in Supply Chain, but NIICS. Um, but um, folks on, on this webinar may not be familiar with it. I, I don't know if you could take just a couple of minutes and sort of explain a little more about what this uh, initiative does and uh, how it can help. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really, th this new initiative, National Initiative for Improving Cybersecurity and Supply Chains, uh, kind of spun out of a White House Cybersecurity Summit from last August, where there were a collection of CEOs from across primarily tech and other sectors 
uh, as well as, uh, you know, for example, our Secretary of Commerce, Secretary Raimondo, you know, met with the president uh, and to, to discuss actions and commitments that industry and government can take to help improve the state of the nation's supply chain, uh, supply chains and cybersecurity. And, and this was a commitment that uh, our secretary made, you know, certainly working with us at NIST to, to launch this effort to understand and very much work with industry to better understand the, the cybersecurity supply chain challenges and uh, get a better sense of kind of industry activities in these areas and find ways that the government can be most helpful to either fill in gaps or really just amplify awareness and help to you know, incentivize greater adoption of good practices that may already be out there or that, that will emerge through collaboration. Uh, we recognize certainly that, that the supply chain discussion over the last year is very much focused on software supply chain security. So this also presents an opportunity to expand that scope beyond just software to again, look at hardware, to look at you know, firmware, to look at not just information technologies, but also operational technologies, such as those things that are, that are running the grid, for example. I mean, the, the summit came a couple of months after, on the heels of the colonial pipeline issue. And there've been plenty of ransomware issues, for example, that, that have really you know, escalated you know, our, our, our interest in cybersecurity and, and our need to do something you know, as a nation. Uh, so, so from a NIST and a commerce perspective, this new initiative is an opportunity to partner with, with the broader community uh, to kind of chart, help to chart a path where we can work in unison to understand the challenges and begin to kind of fill some of those gap areas, both from a, a standards and technology perspective, but potentially other, other dimensions of that as well. And this RFI is intended to help inform not just the cybersecurity framework, but certainly directions that we can take with respect to this broader initiative. <coughs> Very helpful. Um, you know, when when I think about um, you know what, um, especially in the healthcare SaaS or what folks are looking for, um, I'm also reminded about um, and you mentioned case studies. Um, that to me would be a very effective way of educating, in particular, um, smaller en entities. So, for example, you know, you mentioned co co colonial. Um, I've, I've sat through uh, seminars where I've heard from uh, some me uh, medical um, centers that had gone through a ransomware attack. And if you think about it through the, the ID, prevent, protect, respond, recover approach, you could easily apply that to various case studies. Um, and in particular, when you think about, a, a, for example, th this one was a hospital, um, they lost their EHR, which included their emergency room and um, uh, and you know all of their their units, which meant they literally had to go back to pen and paper and try to treat their their patients. So it it, it can be um, a life threatening situation, and I wonder if. Um, and I, I, I expect Weedy will probably make this comment um, that that's an effective way to teach. So to go through, and it could be a fictitious one. You wouldn't necessarily have to poke, poke a finger at somebody, but to, to say, you know, from identification all the way to recovery, what are the steps that, and, you know, various types of ent entities would go through? I don't know if that's on your radar screen or if that's outside of the scope of of what NIST would do. You know, give folks a starting place or at least illustrate how another organization has done that. And they're just as, just as valuable if they're fictional as if they're real life. We've been fortunate to have collected a, a, you know, a bunch of what we call success stories on how organizations have uh, adopted the cybersecurity framework and been willing to share their story on what the problem was, how they used the framework, and then what the impact or the value to the organization was. And admittedly, a couple of those are uh, healthcare organizations, and both were university settings, University of Kansas Medical Center 
and University of Pis Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center on their unique uses of the framework in a healthcare setting. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat on those success stories. Certainly there are many beyond, uh, beyond healthcare, but we think those are very valuable and they're very helpful for us to understand how organizations are really using the framework what they learned, maybe what some of the shortcomings were so that we can take that feedback and inform improvements. Uh, certainly, if any of the organizations on today uh, have a story they'd like to share with us, um, you can definitely reach out to us at any time. We'd love to learn from you. And, and if, if you're interested in kind of sharing your success story, and we're happy to work with you to get that uh, shared more broadly. I would also just add quickly that a lot of our workshops are really designed to have those sorts of conversations. We, we thought people really um, did get a lot of, out of looking over someone's shoulder and figuring out uh, their application and their use cases. Um, and even in the privacy framework workshop we had out in Boise, um, we put together a, uh, a scenario and ran people through it before the, um, before the framework was even finished. Uh, people People get very angry about the scenario and they fought about it for a little while, um, but we didn't give them a choice. And once they bought in, it was actually really helpful for people to think about how things like this would actually be applied and used. And so um, I think we're big fans of that approach. Excellent. Uh, well, Beth, before we close, I wanted to give uh, Marilyn and Tina one last opportunity if you had anything else you wanted to raise before uh, we begin to close out the call. Rob, I wanted to just thank Adam and Kevin for joining us today. I can tell you, having worked with federal agencies for the majority of my career, NIST has always been willing to accept our comments. They've been extremely collaborative and always ask us for feedback. And I just wanted to recognize them both for doing that. I've known Kevin for a long time and very happy to have Adam's insights today and really much uh, appreciate them taking time out of their busy schedules to help us better understand the cyber and the other frameworks. Thank oh, I echo. Yes, yes. <laughs> Marilyn, great, great wrap up. And I echo her thanks to you both. It's been a really educational 90 minutes with you both. I, I certainly have learned a lot and really look forward to continued work with NIST. You're a very, very capable and highly regarded organization. We're so pleased that you're able to join us today. Yeah, our, our pleasure. We're, we're happy to, and we appreciate the questions, the, the tough questions, and, and uh, all the feedback. So, and look forward to your RFI responses. Absolutely. Um, Sam, if you could go to the last slide, um, I just wanted to echo Marilyn and Tina. Thank you, Kevin and Adam, for your absolutely wonderful discussion. We, we've had um, agency folks on who, who kept telling us, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that um, and you guys did not take the fifth at all so we appreciate it um, but I just wanted to let folks know uh, we do have two upcoming events on April 26th a very interesting one uh, free to the industry and that's on the uh, provider directory issue uh, of course the no surprises act includes a number of uh, requirements there uh, sponsored by inner systems and then of course our big spring conference um, coming up uh, May 23rd, and we uh, can announce, uh, we just got confirmation from, uh, from ONC that the OCR director uh, will be able to attend. So we're thrilled to have her involved. Um, and again, my last uh, thanks again, Adam, uh, Kevin, uh, Marilyn, and, and Tina, wonderful job. And th 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 thank you all and continue to get involved with Weedy. Thanks so much.